Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Ryan, and welcome to Central Park. We're happy to continue bringing the park to you, both in person as well as virtually, through a handful of programs offered by us at the Central Park Conservancy. Thank you for joining us today on August 30th, 2023, as we take a weekly walk titled Constructing Central Park with me, Ryan. Thanks for joining us again on one of our continuing weekly walk segments, a virtual tour bringing the park to you wherever you're joining us from, whether it be here in Midtown Manhattan or elsewhere around the world. The little walk we're gonna take today is going to be about 30 minutes as we explore a really interesting topic behind the park, who constructed it? Now, a few names might be jumping out into your head. Before we discuss those names, I do want to again thank you for your support of our work here at the Central Park Conservancy. We're the nonprofit private organization that since 1980 has cared for the park, our mission being to preserve and celebrate Central Park as a sanctuary from the pace and pressures of city life, enhancing the enjoyment and the well being of all. As we explore the park, we're using Zoom, which you're probably familiar with at this point. Feel free to use the chat feature to say hello. Let us know where you're joining us from. And if you do have a question, the Q&A feature is going to be the uh, button to click on. I do have my colleagues on the back end, Jose and Desiree, answering any questions you might have today. And the last thing you'll see pop up are going to be some visitor polls that I'll launch throughout the walk today. Now, as we get ready to start our walk, I do want to launch a poll right off the bat. Now, as we explore the park today, we're going to talk about who constructed the park. Again, now that's a vague term, and there might be a few names jumping into your head, but there might be a few surprises that we're going to learn on our walk today. Oftentimes, we think of generally two major names when we uh, think about Central Park and its design. However, a lot of people help to really bring this park to life. They're the true unsung heroes of the park that often don't give the credit they deserve. They are people that help to physically construct the beautiful landscapes we get to admire and explore today. So on that topic, I want to launch my first poll. This is specifically relating to 19th century workers when Central Park was created between 1858 and 1873. And the question is approximately how many people do you think helped to construct Central Park between 1858 and 1873. This is again, just talking 19th century for now. So I'll let everybody vote in that. We're gonna begin our walk by starting over at about 64th Street and Fifth Avenue, entering the park near a pretty familiar location, the Central Park Zoo. Zoo is blocked off though by this building that we're gonna see as we enter into the park here. And many people do enter the park to again, come to the Central Park to Zoo or Tish Children's Zoo, which can be easily accessed from this area. But we're actually stopping here for a different reason. We're entering the park here so we can take a little look at the building that is gracing our entrance to the park. It is the Arsenal Building, Arsenal Building, excuse me, a building that was completed in 1851, used as a munitions and ammunition storage for the New York State Militia being constructed up here in an area where nothing really else existed during that time, meant that it would have been a little bit safer from robbery or types of um, vandalism. We do see eventually when the park is created, just about seven years later, this building being purchased and used as offices for the parks department, which it still is used for today. The reason we're beginning here is because some of the offices that once were in this building belong to some of the park's designers. Some of the park's designers that we know probably pretty well today. When many people think of Central Park, they often think of at least one of these two names. We can see Calvert Vox on the left, a British born architect, and a name that's probably a little bit more familiar on the right, Frederick Law Olmsted, a Connecticut born gentleman. They would go on to design Central Park, Prospect Park, and countless other parks, landscapes, college campuses, roadway system, you name it. We do often, again, give them high credit in designing Central Park, but they were not alone. As we explore the park today, we're gonna learn that a lot of people were helpful in really designing this park and bringing it to life. Again, two people tend to come to mind, but just in the 19th century alone, over 20,000 people were responsible in physically constructing the park's layout. On today's tour, we're gonna dive into a little bit of the work in the 19th century, some in the 20th, and maybe just briefly touch on some of the work in the 21st century that goes on in the park. 
But just in the 19th century alone, over 20,000 individuals helped in constructing this park. And today we often don't really hear many about their stories. So we're gonna change that a little bit on our brief virtual walk today. So as we continue exploring the park, let's walk just for a moment out towards Grand Army Plaza. Walking just outside of the park, we can see a lot of statues and architecture reminiscent of what lies beyond the park's boundaries in the city. This is meant to be a grand entrance to the park. And of course, once we see this, we do start to go beyond that tree line and come to a much more lush natural landscape, as was the purpose behind Central Park's original design, a design that we still see really alive and well today. Maybe a few things have left us like that old reservoir, but we do see a lot of the naturalistic landscape still existing in the park today. And that was the purpose behind this Greensward plan, a plan that stands for grass covered ground. It was meant to create a lot of lush natural beauty that would help to distance us from the reminders of the city. And just a short walk down into the park, we can already start to get some of those sites that really make us forget we're in the middle of midtown Manhattan right here. As we enter the park near this about 59th street entrance, we can look over a landscape that amazingly is entirely human constructed. It's hard to believe that this isn't a piece of Manhattan's past that was fenced off, but rather one that was physically designed to trick our mind into believing it's natural. As we mentioned, over 20,000 individuals were responsible for helping to construct this park. But why exactly were they here? Well, we can look to uh, some of New York City's newer um, creations and marvels to really understand that. Central Park, is, or rather New York City, is no stranger to large capital projects. In the 19th century, a lot of major projects were occurring. These were reservoir systems, various types of water tunnels and water systems, railroads, and even things like the Erie Canal, which we can see pictured here. Constructed between 1817 and 1825, the Erie Canal is an example of one of the projects that brought a lot of newly arriving immigrants to the United States to find economic freedoms and a lot of job opportunities. Projects like this not only supplied jobs, but put New York State on the map, really establishing it as the empire state, the leader in economic strength, um, as well as population. We do see New York City's population booming as this 363 mile waterway that traveled from Albany to Buffalo helped to really increase trade and make New York City one of the largest capital ports for economic trade. We do see, of course, a lot of those workers coming to work on projects like that, finding employment in Central Park as over 20,000 people would help to construct the park's physical layout in just about the first 15 or 20 years alone. We do see largely about two groups responsible for the physical construction of the park. Immigrant groups like Germans who were coming to the park in large numbers between the 1820s and 1850s. They came over in a few different waves, but that 1820 to 1850 wave being one of the largest, where in the 1850s alone, over 800,000 Germans passed through New York. In 1855, we were actually the third largest German concentrated city in the world, just after Berlin and Vienna. We see beyond the Germans, one other group helping to largely play a role in physically constructing the park. That group, uh, we can see some of their culture represented in a statue here with Thomas More, an Irish poet and author. The Irish were amongst the largest groups along with the Germans to help to physically construct the park in the 19th century. We see between 1820 and 1860, a huge wave of Irish immigrants coming over. In fact, um, after the potato blight of 1845, we see throughout the 19th century, the Irish constituting one third of all immigration to the United States. And of course, a lot would find employment in Central Park. In September of 1867, we see roughly 700 people employed by this park project. And when official construction begins in 1858, over 3,000 people are already employed here. Let's walk around the landscape a little bit to better understand the challenges that went into physically constructing this landscape. Now, as we walk up this little hill over here, we can get a little bit of exercise as we walk up the path, but of course, a beautiful day, sun is starting to come out here in Manhattan, so we don't have to deal with that rain. We can make our way to the top of this rock, one of the many overlooks throughout the park, getting a little view on the low-lying area. It's pretty amazing to look over this section of the park and consider what it once looked like. This uh, general section of the park, the majority of it, looked very different at one point in time. We can actually get a little 
kind of representation of what the majority of the park looked like on top of this rock. A small little crevice of the rock is collecting water. And that water is getting a little bit uh, stagnant. Looks like some kind of algae and pond scum growing in there, maybe a little bit of trash. And also looks like a perfect spot for, for mosquitoes to breed, um, possibly spreading malaria. These kind of stagnant, gross looking water bodies is what we found a lot of in Central Park's pre-created um, pre landscape. The landscape was largely rocky and swampy and went through massive transformation to bring to life the lush green that we can see from our high point up here today. Looking around, we see a lot of flowers, shrubs, and trees that were planted to cover up the park's previously rocky and swampy landscape. As we make our way to the bottom of this rock, we can get a better idea of just how difficult it would have been to construct the landscape. This was the most dominating feature around. It's called Manhattan Schist, and it's a very hardy rock, one of five bedrocks found throughout New York City, and one that, again, really just dominated the landscape prior to Central Park's construction. This rock needed to be manipulated drastically in order to create some of the low-lying areas and create a diversity of landscape in the park. This rock is really incredible, though. It gets its name schist from a geological term, schistosity, which means different minerals wear down at different speeds, providing these grooves and striations that we can find in the rock. The rock also has some other cool decoration in it, inclusions of granite, quartz, feldspar, horns blend, and even some mica, which we can see here. Mica being a silicate mineral that kind of provides that glittery type of look within the rock, something that adds a little sparkle when we get the sun shining on it. This rock is beautiful, but imagining the challenge it posed back in the 19th century is something that is pretty incredible to think about. In order to create some of the low-lying landscapes we have in the park today, a lot of this rock had to be excavated. Over 2.5 million cubic yards. How uh, much rock is that? Well, hopefully this illustration will help show you. If you take an American football field, which is roughly about 360 feet, a little bit shy of the roughly 400 plus feet that the um, width of the Empire State Building is, you take that 360 foot football field, raise it to the height of the Empire State Building, which is about 80 floors, and fill it with rock. That's how much rock was excavated from Central Park, or even in some cases brought into the park and imported to be used for different decoration like arches and bridges. That is a lot of rock, and this is before machinery existed. So that meant we were using, or rather the Irish and German workers of the park, were using a lot of hammers, pickaxes, and gunpowder. Over 166 tons of gunpowder, which meant a lot of controlled blastings to create lower lying areas of the park. Of course, some of that rock would be repurposed into various materials as stone breaking gangs would pave down or rather pound down that rock into two to six inch paving stones. Stones that would be used for sewage systems in the park, pathways, some of the early macadamized style of road systems, but also architecture like rips or rather in scope arch, which we can see a little bit over, over here. Uh, Inscope Arch, also being known by a lot of people as the area where Kevin meets the pigeon lady in Home Alone 2, the first encounter being over here. As we make our way past uh, Inscope Arch, though, we can walk a little bit north before making our way a bit to the east, walking over the Gapstow Bridge, another bridge that is created from Manhattan Schiffs, the very same that we were just walking upon. Now we're going to keep walking through and we'll talk a little bit more about some of the schist and rock in the park, but I want to take a moment to enter the Hallett Nature Sanctuary as we pass by these gates. Now the Hallett changed up a lot over the years. It was at one point a purely aesthetic and visual landscape that would eventually be closed off and in modern times reopened to be an explorable woodland. But it's a great example of really how the park was transformed from a rocky, swampy landscape into a lush, naturalistic one that helps to emulate the Catskills and Adirondacks of upstate New York. What we can see as we walk around the Hallett is, of course, a lot of lush woodland. Woodland that was created through a lot of dirt and a lot of poop. We do see a lot of uh, dirt and soil being brought into the park. Soil being brought in from northern parts of the park's landscape, where it's more abundant, as well as areas of New Jersey being brought over from the Palisades and filled in to give a couple foot depth of soil base throughout many sections of the park. Beyond soil, though, something else needed to be brought in to help enrich the park. Enriching the park basically just meant adding some manure. 
So what is that smell? What animal do you think supplied the majority of manure used to enrich Central Park? Uh, this is an 843 acre landscape. So a pretty good amount of poop needed to be brought in. Um, to envision how much manure was brought in, we can think about what New York was like in the back in the 19th century. Uh, to create the park, over 500,000 tons of manure was brought in to help enrich the soil, provide minerals and nutrients to allow these plants to grow in an otherwise really difficult landscape. A lot of the soil being more acidic meant it was very difficult for some plants to grow. So that manure would help out a lot. And I'm gonna end this poll in just a moment. I'm glad to see that very few people are voting for people in this one. Um, but as I end this poll, I see that a majority of people know their stuff about poop because horses was the right answer. Uh, we do see horses providing the majority of manure in the parks enrichment process. The 1889 Annual Board of Health uh, issued a report that year that stated on any average day in New York City, 550 tons of manure were collected from city streets each day primarily coming from horses. There were a lot of these other animals around. Well, a lot besides maybe cows. At one point in time, they were good a bit, but horses very regular, especially when we think of horse-drawn carriages, early omnibus and trolley type activity that might've been drawn from horses. We do see a lot of horse existing throughout New York City, providing a lot of manure to help enrich the park. So thanks to all of those horses, which of course had bridle paths to ride around in the park, we do see a lot of the park's landscape being able to thrive, allowing some of these trees to grow in and mature, creating the, of course, lush canopies we have in the park today. And exploring around the Hallett is a great area to think about how the park was created. The Hallett is really just a big rock face, originally being called the promontory, which means a rocky area of land that juts out into a water body, just as this one does in the pond. But of course, thinking about the creation behind it is a pretty incredible feat. And as we exit the Hallett, we can think about this as we visit some other, maybe more unique landscapes. Let's make our way to the Northwest. And as we start to travel a little bit through the park, we can make our way over towards the Heckscher Playground section, but specifically near Umpire Rock, where we can see Heckscher Ball Fields. Walking over today to what is a uh, series of about six baseball and softball diamonds. We're seeing what was originally a children's play area. Of course, just a flat plot of land back then. Looking over these areas, doesn't look that impressive today, but again, thinking about what we know behind the park's creation, it being a rocky and swampy area and over 20,000 people working in the first 20 year period of the park alone, meant that landscapes like this were probably more deceiving than we think. Ones like this took a lot of work to level out as the park was not a flat landscape, but rather a very rocky and wavy one. That's still illustrated by the namesake behind Manhattan Island. That comes from the word Manhattan, which means place of many hills. Gives us the idea that New York City and Central Park was not always as flat as it seems today. But as we walk through here, we can again marvel in the fact that a lot of rock was excavated from the park to create these clear areas. Um, we see workers, specifically stone breaking gangs, having some of the most difficult jobs. They had to cut through over 300,000 cubic yards of rock to basically create low lying areas like this. That meant crushing over 35,000 cubic yards into paving stone for, for other projects and architecture, importing over 6 million bricks to the park, over 35,000 barrels of cement, a bunch of gravel and sand in order to create proper drainage for these fields as well. We do see a lot of these rock blasting gangs, of course, also having very difficult jobs as rock blasting was not a safe job. We'll talk a little bit more about that as we make our way to the most difficult landscape in Central Park to construct. One that is pretty reminiscent of Hector Ball Fields. And as we walk our way up north, we can wrap around the carousel, enjoying some tunes as we go. And we'll actually make our way to a location, which is pictured behind my little uh, illustration bubble here. It's none other than Sheet Meadow. Sheet Meadow, a landscape we know well, one that we know for its historic use throughout the mid 20th century, a lot of activism, concerts, and much more. But one, one that we may not know as the most difficult and costly landscape in all of Central Park to construct. Looking over it again, it's a big open field. What's so hard to construct about that? 
Well, again, a lot of rock that was plaguing this area, making it a very uneven and very um, oddly spaced out area. In order to construct this area, an over 16 foot high rock face had to be removed, kind of reminiscent of the maybe about eight or nine foot boulder we can see somebody standing on here. Blasting off these large rock cliffs would lead to a more flowing uh, flat area that, of course, dirt and soil would help to create the perfect balance of this pastoral meadow. Looking around, though, we can still see reminders of some of the rocks that stick out through this area. Again, this is a really hardy rock that's over 500 billion years old. It's the second oldest bedrock of New York City's five bedrock layers, and it must have been very difficult to remove. Blasting this rock away using gunpowder was the primary way of removing it, which meant boring holes, filling it with gunpowder, lighting a fuse, and running away. Uh, we do see a lot of controlled blastings occurring within the first approximately five to eight years of the park's construction. The first really five or six years, you could imagine a lot of controlled detonations were occurring as over 166 tons of gunpowder was used to blast away segments of Central Park. This was a dangerous job. And you can imagine these blasting gangs did have strict, precaution, strict precautions. Uh, for example, one of the precautions was that a flag would go up about an hour or two before blasting occurred and would basically signify that everybody in the entirety of the park's acreage had to stop working until that flag was lowered. That, as well as a few other safety precautions, did keep these pretty rugged procedures pretty safe. But of course, there were still casualties in constructing the park. Uh, two gentlemen, two Irish workers, Luke Flynn and Timothy McNamara, both lost their lives in the construction of the park. Uh, they're actually also two of the few names that we really have of the workers that worked in Central Park. Again, we tend to remember Vox and Olmsted very well. We tend to find that it's hard and very difficult to find names or even pictures of people that helped to construct the park. These people are often forgotten, but their work is simply um, hard to uh, miss as we explore the park today. And again, this tour is meant to give credit to some of those people that we might not have names for, but of course we can see physically the incredible work and the tenacious backbreaking work that they completed in order to give us a place to escape and picnic today. As we look around this area, we can again reminisce on how much has changed. The waving rock that flows out of this area of the park reminds us of what this landscape once looked like, a very rugged one that was once dubbed Badlands. One of the reasons behind Central Park's location being chosen was because of this rock. And again, looking over Sheep Meadow, it's easy to forget how far the park has come. Thanks again to largely the Irish, German, and some Italian workers that physically constructed the park throughout the 19th century. As we uh, make our way through this area, there's one last thing I want to mention, and it is beyond the people that shape the park, some of the natural forces. Now, looking at this section of the rock, you might be able to notice a little bit of kind of grooves and movements throughout there. Now, those grooves and movements we can notice are actually running opposite. They're running perpendicular to some of the striations that are running horizontal in this photo. Those striations that are running horizontally are the ones that are coming from that term schistosity means the rock is weathering down at different speeds, those little different horizontal lines are being formed. But you might notice there's a little bit of a different kind of line being formed on this rock. And that line is coming from something pretty interesting, something that left Canada about 90,000 years ago. What we can see here is an image provided by National Geographic. Shout out to National Geographic, who recently hosted the film festival with us in the park, an annual one that is um, been going on for over 20 years now. Um, but what we can see here is an image from uh, National Geographic that shows the Laurentide Ice Sheet, a sheet of ice that borders portions of North America and runs really throughout the majority of Canada. At one point in time, about 90,000 years ago, a chunk of ice broke off this Laurentide Ice Sheet, traveling from Labrador, Canada, which is nearby the end of that red arrow, and making its way southwest, eventually ending over where New York City is today, 10,000 years ago. That glacial melt and the deposition of terminal moraine or rock, sediment, clay, sand, and all that other stuff that was brought along with the glacier 
melted and deposited in that area, helping to form some of the formations to the land in which we live in, like Queens, Long Island, and Brooklyn, which would actually be underwater if not for that glacial melt. All of that uh, bedrock is actually below sea level. So if not for all that moraine being deposited, we probably wouldn't be able to live over there. But we do see that ice sheet passing through, dragging other large rocks and boulders along with it, creating some of the grooves like we can see in this photo. You might notice again, a very subtle little dip right in the middle of this red rectangle. And that's actually a groove from a glacial erratic or a rock slowly being dragged over this location approximately 10,000 years ago. Looking throughout the park, we can find several of these in many different locations. And it's just one of the incredible uh, natural forces that help to shape the park. Because while the park is human constructed, this rock is the most natural thing you will find here. And it shows, again, nature's work in helping to construct Central Park. Something that Vox and Olmsted loved and purposely included because of that. As we exit Sheep Meadow, we're going to walk a good bit across the mall, making our way east towards our final little stop or two, taking a quick moment to pass through the Dean Slope, going through a pastoral meadow and Sheep Meadow. Now let's walk to a more natural grass-filled meadow. We'll make our way through this little area and join some pollinators along the way before finding our way back near our starting location as we walk towards the Tisch Children's Zoo and eventually stop by the Central Park Zoo. Now we do see, of course, a very familiar landscape uh, existing here, one that we started just nearby in the beginning of our tour. And the reason I wanted to bring us over here is because I wanted to touch on a few of the little, or at least one little project that occurred in the 20th century. Of course, a lot of physical work thanks to the Irish, German, and Italian workers that helped to physically lay out the park in the 19th century. But a lot of work was also done in the 20th century. The 20th century, kind of has its parallels to the 19th, where a lot of major projects occurred throughout New York City and the United States really um, as well. We see this occurring during an interesting time as well too, because a lot of really negative events were occurring throughout the United States in the 20th century. Events like the Great Depression between 1929 and 1939, as well as other financial crises that really limited New York's economic stability and financial stability, especially in caring for parks and landscapes like this. Today, we get to see a very beautiful zoo, but the zoo has changed up a lot. This is actually the third iteration of the zoo. Some of you may be familiar. The zoo, again, did start very differently back in the 19th century, beginning its life as a menagerie, a French term which means animals being kept in captivity, looking more like a pound than a zoo we might imagine today. That original zoo actually being in the basement of the Arsenal building really helps to uh, imagine a pound, if you imagine those animals stored down there. But of course, that would begin to change really by the end of the 19th century and especially throughout the 20th century. The first change to occur to the zoo would be under the administration of Robert Moses, a parks commissioner that was appointed uh, between 1934 and 1965. We do see him bringing on a lot of change to New York City and Central Park in particular, with projects like the zoo being his first project. Now, we see a lot of large projects occurring during, uh, during the 20th century. And amazingly, they're done during a time of, again, a great financial difficulty in New York and the world. The Great Depression did cause a lot of, of course, um, economic catastrophe and loss of jobs and professions. However, we do see federal funding and several different New Deal programs being created to provide work to people throughout the United States. Robert Moses would take advantage of several of these New, uh, work, new Deal programs through the Civil Works Administration, helping to fund, or fund major projects like the recreation of the Central Park Zoo using primarily federal funding. Um, really avoiding tax dollars and New York City money, helping to bring to bring back to life um, really areas that were very decrepit looking. Here's an image that we can see, which is not even when the zoo is at its worst state. <laughs> this is actually a little bit nicer of a uh, time for the zoo, but still one that looks very different than we see as animals were stored in big bird cages. That 1934 restoration helped to really create a more naturalistic layout for the zoo. Many of the buildings that were created during this time are still remnant, are still visible and in use today. As Amar Embry II and a team of about 
one to two dozen individuals created the new parks design or the new zoo's design over 16 days, featuring a lot of brick, limestone, and concrete, material that was inexpensive and easy to construct very quickly. We find on um, December 2nd, 1934, the zoo reopening and the zoo getting a lot of, of course, beneficial changes, including habitats and enclosures that are more naturalistic. One of my favorites being this image of the bear's den being constructed for that 1934 zoo reopening. The zoo today, of course, has undergone another restoration work um, around the about 1980s, as we do see the Wildlife Conservation Society, who cares for it today, taking over, um, spawning from the Zoological Society, who maintains all of New York City zoos today. And thanks to the continuous work throughout the 19th, 20th and 21st century, we see areas like the zoo being thriving landscapes and ones that we love to visit, but also that I think a lot of the wildlife enjoy their time here too. Like everybody's favorite, the sea lion enclosure just in the middle. As we do come towards the end of their uh, walk today, I want to shout out one last group who helps to provide a lot of major contributions to the park, both in the 20th century and today in the 21st century. It's none other than the organization I'm a part of, the Central Park Conservancy. So honored to work for this group of about three to 400 employees that helps to keep this park looking clean and green. And along with our incredibly committed volunteer group, um, we do an incredible job, I have to say, of, key, of caring for this park, preserving all of its incredible rich landscapes and history. And of course, um, having a very fun time doing so. Can you spot myself or any of our other guides in this photo? Uh, I see one or two of us on the bottom right of this photo in case you want to do a little Where's Waldo. But as we come to the end of our tour today, I want to give a special shout out again to all my colleagues, all of our operations staff, especially who are out there physically keeping the park clean and green. Again, oftentimes the overall designers of the park and the people that are overseeing things get a lot of the credit, but really it's the unsung heroes, the people that are out there physically constructing and caring for the park that keep it remaining clean, green, and beautiful. So a tremendous thank you to all of our staff and all of our volunteers who helped to keep this park thriving. As we come to the end of our walk today, I know we covered a lot in the 30 minute period, but of course there's still more to learn about. We do have a lot of other um, information available on our website and even tours that dive into more depth than this. Um, be on the lookout for in the future when we do bring back our Who Built Central Park Tour, which covers this and a lot more information relating to who built the park. So if you ever do wanna learn more, Keep an eye on our website and you can find some of the new tours that are constantly being introduced. But of course, we always encourage you to come back and join us next Wednesday for another weekly walk. I will keep this room open for a little bit longer to answer any last minute questions we might have out there. But I do want to thank you again for your support in keeping the park clean and also supporting our work of caring for it. So once again, thanks to all of our staff and more importantly, a lot of the various immigrant groups that helped to physically construct this park back in the 19th century. Thank you so much for joining us today and hopefully learning a little bit about the park. From all of us here at the Central Park Conservancy, stay safe, be well, and we'll see you soon, everybody. Take care. <laughs>